Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the DX Forum. Everyone here interested in DX? Hopefully. I'm Mike W7Q. I'm your forum's host for this event. Um, and uh, so that will be a multi-staged presentation hosted by Jay, uh, K4ZPE, ZLE. And he'll uh, introduce the various presenters. And uh, I will be passing out um, evaluation forms as this uh, gets underway so you can comment on what you think about the presentations of the individual presenters or uh, any recommendations or that kind of thing. So let me turn it over to Jay and uh, enjoy. OK, good morning, everyone. Glad you could make it. Uh, the crowd's down a little bit from what we normally have. But uh, after they hear these presentations uh, today, I'm sure they'll be back with us uh, after that. We're really proud, proud to have you here. And uh, by the way, you, at every break, we're going to have uh, someone selling tickets for a chance on the ASU, uh, I think it's the 991 Alpha. And uh, the money that, that, that comes in from that raffle, 100% of that money is used to help fund the expedition. So it's not money coming to our club to, to be used for picnics or whatever. OK, let's get started. We've got four really great presentations today. The first one's going to be led off by Adrian, and it's going to be about the Victor, Sierra, Victor 84 Sierra Alpha Alpha. So Adrian, please come on up here and uh, get started with it. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming here. I hope you like the expedition cartoon. Um, let me start my presentation here. OK, so um, I'm here to talk about the uh, Victor 84 Sierra Alpha Alpha, the expedition um, that took place in uh, February uh, for about uh, two weeks, from February 6 to February 18. Uh, it was a low band focus, the expedition. And as the results um, shows, uh, we really uh, achieved our goal. Um, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to our website. We have a lot of uh, cool pictures there. Uh, the website is victor 84 sierra .com. Yes. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the expedition had uh, 25 uh, uh, team members uh, from uh, 11 countries and uh, five continents. It was uh, quite of, uh, a logistic, uh, logistics... Uh, um, can you hear me OK or? Yeah. Our, uh, oh, too loud. <laughs> OK, we can. Is this better? All right. Uh, this is our uh, team picture that we took on uh, February 8, which was the uh, official opening of the, uh, the expedition. Um, like I said, uh, quite, a, quite a big team. And uh, that was needed because, uh, as you see, you will see later, we had uh, two different sites and uh, quite uh, a bit uh, far apart. Our team leader, uh, Kilo One Lima Zulu, um, started the, uh, the expedition together with his friend, uh, Jeff, uh, K1 Zulu Mike. Uh, initially, they wanted to do uh, the expedition together to do uh, uh, low bands from the area of uh, Brunei. But uh, it turned out that uh, to uh, make a little bit of uh, damage into the um, a uh, tough uh, path uh, that it is from Brunei. We need, he needed to put together a bigger the expedition, a lot more people and a lot more logistics. Uh, Jeff, uh, K1 Zulu Mike, the uh, low band guru that everybody knows, um, started uh, contacting Tamat, Victor 85 Tango Lima. And after a few months of uh, work, he was able to get uh, um, our license, which you can see here um, to the right. Uh, it's a piece of paper that opened us, uh, opened up quite a few doors for us uh, once we got to uh, Brunei. Brunei is a little country in the uh, island of Borneo. Um, it's uh, basically um, bordered by uh, Malaysia, and to the south of Borneo Island is Indonesia. Uh, the island is uh, an absolute monarchy. The moment you uh, step down at the airport, uh, uh, you are reminded that this is a country totally owned uh, by the uh, uh, the Sultan, who is uh, the head of state and also uh, has uh, absolute powers over the uh, people and land of the country. 
It's, uh, Brunei is a rich country in a culture and history. Um, in our uh, little bit of uh, free time we had, we were able to uh, visit some of the sites. Uh, you can see here um, the famous uh, mosque in the capital of Brunei and uh, the small uh, castle that the Sultan has, the, his palace has, uh, with the 1788 uh, rooms. Quite a view uh, from the city. What is uh, Brunei famous for? Well, uh, the two most famous things are uh, the long nose of monkey and the uh, $1 gallon of gas. That was uh, pretty cool because we needed to do a lot of driving uh, to uh, get this, the expedition uh, running properly. Um, we decided that we needed two different operating sites, the uh, CW site uh, and also the EME site, uh, pictured there on to the left. Um, we had uh, two nice uh, tents with the air conditioning. That was uh, quite, a, quite an advantage because uh, it was really hot. Brunei is at the, uh, on the equator, so the, uh, it's really hot and humid. We didn't have a lot of rain, but still the heat would be unbearable if you don't have air conditioning onto the, uh, um, onto the beach. To the right is a picture of the uh, villa where the, uh, most of the team stayed and had their uh, meals. Uh, it was also the SSB site and the FTA site. Uh, the two sites were uh, quite, uh, quite apart from each other, about uh, 40 minutes driving. Uh, apart from the inconvenience of driving from one site to another, uh, there was, uh, like I said, no issue with uh, cost because gas is extremely inexpensive. Um, the villa was uh, very comfortable. It had uh, even a kitchen and we decided to uh, have a local chef uh, cook for us so that uh, the team can be focusing on uh, making cues and not uh, uh, the daily chores. The, uh, the bedrooms were pretty comfortable. Uh, we had the, uh, um, also air conditioning in the, in the villa and um, the cook was uh, cooked mostly Italian food and uh, some Chinese from time to time. It was uh, pretty convenient this way um, the team could eat at different times uh, and uh, show up to their uh, daily uh, operating shifts. To put together the expedition like this, uh, there's quite a bit of logistics involved. Uh, we had to uh, ship quite a few, uh, quite a bit of equipment, heavy equipment, especially the AMS. Uh, we had the uh, ACOM and expert AMS that uh, traveled the world from um, um, USA, Germany, and Bulgaria, three different crates. You can see a picture of one of the crates there uh, as uh, it arrived at the house of uh, 80, uh, Victor 84 Tango Lima, our uh, local connection there. Uh, see pretty big uh, crates and uh, Krasi through his uh, company in Massachusetts uh, put together the logistics to get this uh, heavy crates uh, air freight uh, to, uh, to Brunei. Uh, we also had to hire some local trucks uh, to get these uh, crates from uh, Tamat's house to, uh, to the beach where the main location, the CW site um, uh, was uh, located. Um, it was uh, quite a bit of uh, equipment, like I said, and uh, that helped us uh, make um, quite a few QSOs considering the uh, um, minimum of the solar cycle that we are, right, uh, we are now at. Our site, the CW site, the main site of the, the expedition was uh, located on a beach. Um, it was a public beach, but the, uh, the locals were, were very accommodating. Uh, as you see on the picture on the right, they, um, we set up uh, an area there uh, where uh, we set up the flags of uh, each member of our uh, the expedition. The, um, um, the, expe the, the site was actually just a public beach. Initially, we were concerned that uh, people will uh, uh, just pass by, go uh, and bump into our antennas, but we didn't have uh, an issue too much. The locals don't seem to go to the, to the beach that much, probably because of the very high temperatures. Um, also, to the uh, left of the beach, there is uh, a river that has uh, crocodiles. And to the right, uh, the beach is a bit uh, rocky, so uh, that worked to our advantage. It took a lot of uh, planning to uh, put together the two sites. Uh, the picture at the top, uh, you'll see how the antennas are um, uh, installed. We had uh, quite a few of antennas so that we can have a lot of stations running in, uh, in the same time. Um, this is a Google Earth picture that we used um, to um, 
uh, make the planning of the antenna. Right here is the tent, the, our CW tent, and uh, number one, two, three, four, and so forth. Up to eight uh, were the uh, nine, actually, were the uh, different antennas that we used um, on the beach to uh, um, increase the number of uh, QSOs. Uh, also, uh, since we had the beach to ourselves, so we were able to uh, arrange the antennas in such a way to minimize um, interference. In addition to that, um, some of our members, uh, I think about five of them were from uh, Malaysia, and uh, they were able to drive, uh, it was about a five hour drive to cross the border from um, Malaysia to Brunei and do a site survey of the different sites that we considered so that uh, when we got to the destination, we had uh, no uh, big surprises. There were a few things that we were interested in. We wanted to make sure we had enough space to have uh, beverages. We wanted to make sure that it's um, a comfortable site that will have uh, electricity available. And uh, we also wanted to make sure there is no uh, local noise. Um, what, noise is one of the biggest issues in today's uh, world as uh, people are upgrading from the old uh, type of light bulbs to the new LEDs that supposedly save power but produce a lot of noise. So we uh, didn't have uh, uh, many surprises. Uh, we realized that the power that was available there on the, on the site was not uh, good enough for our, ampl our amplifiers. When you fire up uh, five or six amplifiers at the same time, uh, regular uh, power plugs don't uh, help too much. So. Um, there was another logistical nightmare that we had to solve. Uh, we involved the local uh, electrical company and um, they accommodated us with some uh, really heavy uh, power lines uh, to, the, um, to the beach side. Um, these are some of the antennas that we used. Uh, the, for 160, we had a, a spider beam uh, pole of a 28 meter high, really, really, uh, a nice antenna performed very well. It's basically an inverted L right on the beach, which uh, worked uh, wonders uh, for uh, transmitting. For receiving, we had um, a very long beverage, and in addition to that, uh, um, for Europe, we had a DHDL antenna. This antenna, it's so easy to uh, install, and it takes very little space, and uh, this is what we use to do um, most of the QSOs to Europe. The beverage was... Uh, um, Located, uh, hard to see in this picture, but along the line of the shore, um, very long beverage, and we pointed that to North America. We switched uh, two antennas uh, manually, depending on the area that we wanted to work. Um, we had a lot of uh, spider beams, uh, five-band spider beams. Uh, those are very uh, nice antennas, um, and they were shipped directly to us from, um, um, from Germany by spider beam. These are incredibly uh, well-designed antennas. They've been used to WRTC, and uh, as you know, they perform really well. The big advantage for, of the um, spider beam is obviously if something breaks, since there's just wires involved, you just put them together and you know, um, everything works. For the um, 30 meters, we had the, a big IR. Uh, it, uh, although we could use this on different bands, it mostly stayed on 30 meters, and this antenna uh, did most of the QSOs on uh, 30 meters uh, on CW. Uh, again, proximity to the uh, salt water uh, did wonders um, for this antenna. Our uh, hero was our uh, four uh, 40 meter four square provided to us by DX Engineering. It was an incredible workhorse. This antenna alone, as you see there in the picture, the um, the four square did almost 25% of our QSOs. So out of the 60,000 QSOs we did, 25% were done with this antenna. Uh, when 40 meters, the band was, was our best band. It was open uh, most of the night, and we were able to uh, really put it to work and uh, increase the number of our QSOs. Uh, on the uh, SSB site at the Villa, we had also some uh, spider beams and uh, a Kushcraft uh, A3S and uh, a bunch of verticals that uh, um, pictured here on the picture on the right. Uh, we use these verticals uh, mostly for the FTA contacts. Uh, we did quite a few of those, and um, um, thanks for, to the FTA, we were able to increase the number of QSOs and make quite a few uh, people happy. Um, for the uh, 160 and 80, uh, ICOM provided us with two incredible radios, the 7610. Uh, when uh, Krasi and Jeff uh, decided to uh, 
put together this the expedition, the first thing they said is uh, we got to call ICOM and get the same radios that we had in Spradley last year because they really performed well. Um, it's one thing to have a radio that works and works at W or SSB or whatever, but when you have to work 160 um, and 80 meters because of the noise and the difficulty to uh, pull the, um, the cues or the, the stations out of the noise, you really need a, a receiver that has a, a lot more capability than just a regular radio. So um, ICOM provided us these two uh, um, radios and uh, they did uh, all the QSOs for 160 and 80. To the left is the 160 position, to the right is uh, uh, the 80 meter position. The two friends, uh, Krasi and Jeff, basically manned these uh, two stations from uh, sunrise to sunset, uh, like uh, clockwork, you will, uh, and uh, didn't miss any, any opening. Keep in mind that Brunei for the East Coast is almost the um, antipode, so even working them on 20 meters is a challenge but working them on 160 is even a bigger challenge. A little bit about 160. Uh, the band opened uh, at sunset for us. This is when we started the 160 work. And um, the propagation went up and down. We had the openings. They are, were incredible for almost uh, 45 minutes. Uh, working W5 districts was pretty cool, uh, pretty easy with the 599 signals. but. Um, to the east of, Ma of Mississippi, uh, most of those sites, uh, uh, most of those states listed there, like North Carolina or Georgia and Florida and so forth, uh, had uh, a hard time getting us, but were able to get through. Now, and the biggest or the hardest part is the one going to W3 and uh, W2, and uh, those are really, really difficult. Uh, and um, November Oscar 3 Mike was one of the lucky ones that we're able to get from uh, Pennsylvania. But even with those, all these difficulties, we ended up uh, doing uh, um, almost 4,500 QSO just on 160. So that really um, helped a lot of uh, hams. Um, the Northeast Coast, uh, the one area, um, the first, one of the first lucky ones to work us was uh, W1 uh, November Alpha from uh, Cape Cod. And then Don, November 1, Delta Golf, and uh, a few others uh, from Massachusetts and Maine were able to work us, and uh, uh, we've got a lot of uh, smiles from that area. Um, November Oscar 3 Mike was the most easterly contact from North America that was able to uh, get us on uh, through a short path. Uh, propagation to Europe was no problem. Uh, it felt like they're uh, across the, the water there, very uh, strong signals. Um, the W6 and W7 area on the west coast also had no uh, hard difficulty on getting us. Uh, everything else was, was difficult. It was uh, quite a challenge. Uh, the exact antipod point for Brunei is actually in Brazil. So we mentioned there that uh, uh, we were able to hear the station of, uh, the big station or super station at Brazil, Papayanki 2 X-Ray Bravo, but we're not able to uh, pull a QSO. I guess uh, this is the, uh, the, the price we pay to do a uh, 160D expedition in, um, um, in a bottom of the solar cycle. For the first time ever, we're able to do uh, six meters um, EME contacts. Uh, our um, friend there, Tamat, Victor 84, um, Tango Lima, was able to get us for the first time um, approval to work um, six, the six meter band. Uh, we did this with the K3 and the uh, expert amplifier, uh, and um, uh, all these contacts are performed by our uh, FT guru, Andy Limazoto, Hotel Mike. He is uh, an expert of getting this, uh, um, these type of contacts done in a very, uh, with limited uh, equipment available, such as we had in Brunei. This is the antenna that we used that was provided uh, for the EME. This was provided by uh, M Square. This is an incredible piece of equipment. It, uh, it gives you about uh, 19 dB gain um, if you're uh, next to uh, uh, salt water. And that's exactly what we did. It um, weights only 23 pounds. And uh, although the boom, the boom is 43 feet, uh, when you look at it, it's basically a, a monster giant. Um, when you look at the length of this antenna, um, 
But when you pack it and then assemble it, it fits in a four feet packing size. It's just amazing. It's so easy to carry around. And uh, it was designed by um, the uh, EME uh, guru, Whiskey Seven Golf Juliet. And uh, thanks to EM Square, um, who was very kind to us. And uh, on a certain time, um, um, time frame, he, they provided us with this uh, antenna. Um, our, um, the expedition was very popular there. We made, um, um, let's see if I can get the, um, we made the, the news there, the local newspaper. Um, you see there the picture of the team with the local uh, hams. Uh, ham radio on Brunei is uh, quite popular. It's actually, the, cl the clubs are very strong. They still believe that, uh, uh, rightfully, that ham radio could be uh, uh, one way to um, uh, use in case of emergencies when any other communication uh, means are not available. Uh, this is uh, from the um, night news. Uh, I'm going to try to play it. Um, bad. Um, the locals were very friendly to us. Uh, they uh, made us feel uh, like home. Um, they uh, set up some uh, parties. Their XYLs uh, came and helped and uh, um, it really, uh, everybody cooked uh, food in their home homes and brought it to the, uh, to the CW site on the beach. Um, it's, uh, it was uh, quite a uh, quite of an experience learning about their customs and their country. Uh, Brunei is a heavily uh, Muslim country where uh, women have to be uh, are forbidden to show skin. Uh, their skin. Uh, that's why going to the beach is not a popular activity in Brunei. Also, um, alcohol is forbidden by law. Uh, you're not allowed to. Uh, they basically they don't sell it, and uh, also smoking is forbidden. But um, there are exceptions, of course. Um, tourists are allowed to bring uh, six cans of beer or two bottles of uh, hard liquor. Um, most of the flights go into Brunei uh, go from Singapore, which is uh, the opposite uh, type of society where anything is possible and allowed. Um, we even uh, tried some of the local foods. Uh, you can see uh, this one here is the national food. It's called uh, Ambuyat. It's made from the sap of a palm tree. Kind of uh, unusual, to say the least. Um, you have to put a lot of uh, different type of uh, dressings on it to uh, make it uh, edible, but <laughs> it was uh, popular. Um, while we were there, we visited a, a quite a famous ham, uh, Victor 85 Alpha. We had a lot of uh, fun at his house. You can see it here. He has a couple of towers and uh, any equipment you can think of. Uh, here's a picture of uh, myself and uh, him. He, uh, he was a quite a funny guy uh, and uh, very friendly. He came and visited us almost daily on the beach and uh, wanted to play around at the station and a uh, very talkative guy. And um, he is one of the guys that helped us put together some of the complex logistics necessary to get things done in Brunei. And the reason for that is that uh, his daughter is the next queen in line on Brunei. So obviously that opened quite a few doors for us and uh, that's why we had uh, quite a bit of a quite, a quite a good time there. He served us uh, lunch at his uh, little palace there. Uh, we needed a little bit of a break from the QSOs and this was a welcome um, um, spirit time uh, experience. These are some uh, club log statistics. Um, although uh, Brunei is uh, number 158 on the global DXSC standings, 4160 is number for East Coast is number 34. So it's an incredibly rare entity. You know, 160 is a complex beast. When you visit a country, bring some equipment with you, it's very easy to throw a piece of wire or some kind of beam, work in 20 meters or whatever. But for 160, you need some heavy, complex uh, um, equipment and logistics to get it together. So that's why very few of the expeditions um, uh, got involved in setting up a 160 operations from Brunei. The, our most popular band was uh, 40, we did, and uh, obviously 20 meters. We did almost uh, 60,000 QSOs, um, out of which uh, about uh, almost 16,000 were in FT8. So FT8 is here to stay, and they will give us uh, 
something to do and those are times when uh, there's just no propagation um, obviously um, Asia um, contacts with Asia were about 40 percent and Europe 45 percent as expected the tough area of North America gave a, um, we made almost 10 percent of the contacts but we did make the DXCC uh, almost uh, 151 countries according to club log that was pretty cool made uh, a lot of people happy those that worked us got uh, a very nice uh, QSL car designed by our QSL manager, Lima Zulu One, Juliet Zulu, Tony from Bulgaria. Um, it's um, a QSL card. I think everybody in North America uh, that requested a QSL card direct uh, should have gotten it by now. Uh, everyone from overseas should be getting it in the next few days. And um, we be, we're going to be in about six months period. We're going to be uploading the whole log uh, to Lab Book of the World, and uh, make everyone happy. This is, was a, the expedition sponsored and financed by the members of the, the expedition. We did not uh, request that any funds from any club or any organization whatsoever. Um, these are quite a few of the people that uh, these are the people that donated um, to our the expedition, and uh, as a thank you for giving them. Uh, a first in 60 meter or 60 meter or 160 or um, you know whatever other band and um, we have to mention the DX engineering and ICOM that really uh, um, helped this uh, the expedition uh, achieve its goals uh, without antennas and, uh, and radios you cannot possibly uh, get anything achieved we're also one thing that I wanted to say the expert amplifiers that we had um, the new 1.5 kilowatt they work constantly, um, uh, they run 24 seven and they worked wonders. Remember that working from uh, the expedition where the temperatures are over 100 degrees, it's different than working from your home and your garage where you turn on your AC and uh, the equipment, uh, even though it doesn't say so, the equipment thanks you. Um, well, I'm gonna play a little bit of uh, a video of the, uh, of the site and while I'm not going to take any questions that you might have, it's a, a drone view of our uh, operating uh, site. Give me one second. Actually, we could play the uh, first, the, um, let's see if this is going to play. Okay, so th this is uh, the, uh, a clip from the um, local TV uh, station. We, um, during the opening on February 9, uh, 2019, a lot of um, local um, um, representative from the, um, the, the mayor, the uh, telecommunications office, um, showed up at our site and uh, they were pretty excited about our the expedition. It was uh, quite a big deal uh, locally there, um, I guess uh, because of um, high profile of ham radio in Brunei. Uh, this made us uh, feel like uh, stars uh, for those uh, few days we stayed, uh, we stayed at our, uh, um, uh, we stayed at, uh, uh, in Brunei. Uh, so while this is playing, I could take a few questions if you guys um, uh, would like to know anything else about our uh, the expedition. Go ahead. Um, I don't think the Sultan of Brunei was a um, was a ham, but his son-in-law, I think, is. so Victor eighty four Alpha. I mean. This current sultan was there for more than 25 years, so maybe the sultan previously, but um, Victor 85 Alpha is uh, one of the important hams there. Like I said, his daughter is the next queen in line, so you know that probably that's why also Ham Radio has a, such a high profile in Brunei. Right? Any other questions? Uh, oh, so this, let me play the. Um, Yes, this is a drone view of our uh, the expedition. A CW site, you see there the spider beam. 
uh, that was sent to us from uh, Germany. We had the three different uh, spider beams. Um, any other questions? All right. uh, you see there in the background was the, uh, this is the uh, 160 vertical. It was so high we, uh, at some point we needed to, in order to do the, uh, the L part of the, um, of the inverted L, uh, we used the drone to put it in the, one of the neighbor, uh, neighboring trees. Uh, this is the VHDL. Um, it had the switching um, system manual. Basically, uh, one of the team members there is moving the coaxial from the VHDL to the uh, um, beverage antenna along the shore there. We, as you can see, we are very close to the, um, to the beach. Also, Brunei is, um, is very close to the equator, which means that the uh, tides are very um, similar, the high tide and the low tide. So uh, we didn't have any issues with the water getting into our cables or other equipment. Um, I think my time is almost uh, up. If there are any more questions, then, oh, go ahead. One more time. Uh, I had about uh, 18, from what I remember. Well, quite a, quite a bit of wire. We had a lot of spools of wire that we had to uh, carry around there and to Brunei. Well, if the, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We had a lot of fun. And uh, thank you, Jay. Adrian's no uh, stranger. He uh, made a presentation last year to us on the 6060 operation, and we appreciate him being here. Okay, next up, we've got, uh, before we have them talk, where's Pat? Raffle tickets. Raffle tickets. Uh, Opportunity, they're five bucks each, five for uh, twenty dollars for uh, the eight ninety one back of the room there. Okay, next up, uh, I did give you the uh, CD, didn't I? Or the thumb drive? Okay, you guys get here. There we go. Okay. As we get started here, uh, again, there's raffle tickets back there, and I think Kevin's got something. I just want to ask you what the time is. Isn't there about 25 Okay, next up is going to be the uh, Ducey Island operation, Victor Papa uh, 6 Delta, and it's uh, entitled Ducey Island, the DX Sharks. And as you see this uh, presentation, I think you're going to understand why they've titled it that. And the people that are going to be presenting are Gene, that K5GS, uh, Dave, K3 Echo Lima, and uh, Les, Whiskey 2 Lima Kilo. So uh, whenever you guys are ready, we'll turn it over to you. Gene, you want to open up with some opening comments? Perfect. Thanks very much. Appreciate 25 it. Minutes. 25 minutes. Oh, man, I'm from New York City. I can do that in, like, real quick. <laughs> New York City, I actually live in Tucson now. Anyway, it's great to be here again uh, at Dayton. It's, uh, I'm glad it didn't rain, very happy about that. We had a wonderful time on Ducey Island and the team leader here behind me is Dave K3EL. Co-team leader is Les W2 Lima Kilowatt. Uh, hopefully in the audience someplace is Rob N7QT, another team member and Chris, N6 Whiskey Mike, who I saw here last night, so I know Chris is here, and our chief pilot, Glenn, uh, KE4KY. Glenn, are you here somewhere? There he is, in the back, standing up in the back. We had a great pilot team from around the world. So what I will do is just kind of give you an overview of, uh, of the project, and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Dave. All right, cool. So. The whole concept of this project came up at Visalia in 2017, so just two years ago last month. We were sitting in a restaurant and we said, where are we going next? Because we had done uh, Chesterfield Island, TX3X before that. And of course, if you've ever been around a de-expedition team, when they say, where are we going next? The first thing that happens is the telephones come out, everybody goes on club log and they look at the most wanted and, and then start theorizing what can we do in a reasonable period of time with prudent risk and a, and a reasonable budget. 
So Ducey came up, and uh, it was number, at the time, number 27. And then there was some refresh of Club Log, and it dropped to number 19 worldwide. So we thought that was pretty cool. So uh, I called uh, Steve Kafka, who's the owner of the Avoi, the ship that we've used on three previous sea expeditions, and asked Steve if he would take us to Ducey. And he said he would. But he also said, you should also talk to N Nigel, uh, the owner of the Braveheart. And we had all theorized that, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but at the time, Nigel owned two ships. He owned uh, Braveheart and he owned Claymore Two. Claymore Two is a supply ship for Pitcairn Island. He supplied Pitcairn four times a year. So we thought maybe we could divert Claymore Two because it was already going to be near Ducey Island. Uh, Nigel came back and said, I have a better idea. Braveheart will be there also with a, a bird watching charter out of Mangareva, French Polynesia. So Nigel, once he finalized the bird watching charter, offered us the Braveheart at a ridiculously perfect price because the other charter paid the repositioning fees. And it had we had to pay for repositioning that we couldn't afford we couldn't afford the Braveheart. So Nigel did a deal for us and the rest is history as they say. We also took a look at the physical location of Ducey Island in the world and realized that it's just a perfect place to, for propagation into Europe, into North America, and of course we can get into Japan easily from there also. And the antenna team uh, of uh, Dave, K3EL, and Walt, uh, N6XM, XG, N6XG, designed a number of antennas specifically to put on the beach and point towards um, the propagation areas that we think were going to be good for us. Okay, you, you've probably seen this on every the expedition chart in the world. You know, we, we're going to uh, make a lot of contacts, have a lot of fun, and uh, this time FT8 was becoming more popular, so we th thought we would also use FT8. And the first time for us, and whether we call ourselves the Perseverance DX Group, PDXG. We've never done EME before, so this time we were going to do six meter EME, and we'll show you a little bit about that. If you're not familiar with uh, Pitcairn Island, uh, it's the home of the uh, mutineers from Mutiny on the Bounty that, that uh, took place in um, April of 1789. And uh, the descendants of the Bounty mutineers are still living on Pitcairn. There's probably, I think, 41 people living there. The uh, Ducey Island is 540 kilometers east of Pitcairn Island. The only way to get to Pitcairn Island is by boat. There are no airports there, which means the only way to get to Ducey is by boat. So we, uh, we took a flight to French Polynesia, Tahiti. We took another hop to Mangareva, French Polynesia out in the Pacific where we met the Braveheart. So you can see um, that circle around the Pitcairn Islands is a, 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 sea, as a reserve. It's a pristine uh, natural reserve. No fishing allowed in there by anyone other than the Pitcairn Islanders, which uh, if you think about it, there's only 41 of them. So <laughs> we were not allowed to fish. And there's some terrific uh, game fish out there. OK. so. The island itself is um, was volcanic in nature, uh, crushed coral, volcanic rock. Um, one thing that surprised us was the, or at least surprised me, was the amount of uh, vegetation on the island. During our previous expeditions, th th we were literally on sandbars with very little uh, vegetation. Ducey is very heavily treed with low level, or, uh, they're small, they're, they're not high, but you would have great difficulty walking in between them. So you can see that there are four um, islets or inlets, and uh, we chose something called Arcadia, which was the largest one and had the most vegetation. And uh, we'll show you pictures of the, uh, 
of the camps. So that's that's the drone view of where we were on on the uh, on the island. And uh, I'm, let's see if I can get this thing to work here. I don't remember where the button is. Oh, there it is. So if you see that little area, we had one camp out here, which was the sideband and the main camp. And the CW camp was about a kilometer, kilometer away right in this area. Uh, and we'll show you some pictures of how to get there because there was no transportation other than your two legs. All right, so if you uh, wanted to get to the CW camp, you would walk into the bush, into what the lagoon, because there's a sea on one side and a lagoon on the other side. You walk into the lagoon, and then you'd start working your way on this little path. You would walk, follow that path, and then you'd see some markers that the guys put up, and then you'd go back into the bush and walk across the island or transverse the island. Ducey Island is famous for nothing. There was a shipwreck there. There's a monument for that shipwreck on the island. And of course, we all had our photographs taken by the, the monument. And uh, several of the crew members that were, uh, no one was killed, by the way. The, the, the ship was just offshore. It almost makes you wonder how, they ha how it happened, because apparently it was a clear day with no foul weather, but they went aground, ship sank. And several of the crew members, or most of them, I guess, took a small boat to Pitcairn Island. It took them two weeks to get to Pitcairn Island. And then several of them apparently went back to live there. So it's a pretty interesting lifestyle. Okay, this is the island residence. Lots of birds. This is the, what's called a Murphy's petrel, this little guy. And, and of course, that's a chick. And, and at that age, they don't fly. They are all over the ground. You know, just think about walking between camps or doing literally anything. One of those guys would be under your foot. So we had to be very careful because one of the things we agreed to was not to disturb or harm any of the wildlife. So these things were, were all over the place. And uh, I guess, I don't know how they estimate 250,000 pairs, but you know, somebody did. Lots of uh, frigate birds and, and beautiful white terns that would just sit in a tree and watch us. Didn't move, you couldn't spook them, they would just watch us. It was just amazing. And of course the ubiquitous crabs all over the place, especially at night when they would uh, come out and, and literally take over anything. Yeah, yeah I, I, I could tell you some stories, but I prefer not to. <laughs> Where's Rob? Is Rob here? Rob had a great story, but if you see Rob, ask him about it. Okay, so we had all the animals on the island, or wildlife. My video. Is it going? Nope. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, we lost the PowerPoint. You want to bring it back up? So, so while while we're trying to work through the technology here, you think so? Okay. So, so the first day we got to the island, we got there. 12 hours earlier because we had phenomenal weather at the crossing from Mangareva. The first day we got unloaded, starting unloading at, um, at sunrise, it was very hot, hot and humid. And we were all really worn out by about um, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. It was just time to quit. We had several of the tents up uh, so we could sleep. We had some generators installed. And one of the guys, Walt, decided to take a, take a swim. You ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll pick it up when he, we finish the video. So 
Well, you gotta, you gotta picture this. It's, it's about 5 p.m., we're hot, we're tired. We're all at the main camp. And Walt says, I'm going to go out and take a swim. <laughs> so Walt goes out to the seaside. What you just saw was on the lagoon side. Walt went out to the seaside. And just as Walt was out of sight, the skipper comes to the camp. And the skipper says, I don't want anybody swimming after 5 o'clock or at night. And of course, sharks. You just saw them. So here we are now, wondering if Walt's going to come back. Well, Walt does come back, and we said, did you see any sharks? And I don't know if you guys know Walt, deadpan. He says, is that what they were? And it was like. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, we didn't lose anybody to sharks. We have a couple of other stories, but we'll spare you of those. And uh, let's see if I can get this going again. No. All right, good, finally. Whew, I don't like this. <laughs> anyway, that's the team. There were 14 of us. You guys and gals have worked in, on previous D expeditions, just about everybody on that chart. They have been to places like Bouvet, uh, Jackie's ZL3 CW, um, of course, Rob and Dave and Arnie. You all know Arnie very well. I think was, this was Arnie's 13th D expedition. And uh, we had a really, really good team. Everybody got, got along pretty well. Uh, if they didn't, we showed them where to go swimming at 5 o'clock. <laughs> but that's my time. I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and he'll tell you everything that I said that was wrong. All right, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the setup we had on the whatever. And what we did was we scheduled every operator two options during his time on. He could be CW, he could be sideband, whatever he chose to do. And we always had at least three stations that were not scheduled, and those stations could be used by anybody who was not on the air at that time for whatever they wanted, as long as they didn't uh, interfere or conflict with a guy who was actually scheduled. And this worked out very, very well. The result of this was that when people weren't scheduled, they sat around, they did FT8, and we wound up with 24,000 something uh, FT8 contacts. Um, three o'clock in the morning when we had no propagation, or even noontime when we had no propagation, guys were sitting there playing with FT8. Um, so that worked out very well. We, I think we were very efficient uh, and effective in the way we scheduled people. Um, That's some of the guys who are at the uh, CW camp. Uh, Lassie, uh, Jackie, ZL3CW, and Haya, DJ9RR. Um, Jackie has a unique distinction. Uh, he was helping the, the crew clear some brush, and uh, he hit himself in the leg with a machete. So we took him over to Arnie, and Arnie patched him up, and he went back out and hit himself again in the same leg with the machete. And so Artie patched him up again. We took the machete away from him. <laughs> and we gave him the Rusty Machete Award for the expedition. So we had a lot of fun with that. He didn't, but we did. We used DXA, uh, thanks to Bob Schmieder, KK6CK, who let us use it so that when you were, uh, we used N1MM for logging. And when N1MM logs you, it puts out a message on its network, and this thing, picks up those messages, and every minute it transmits them by satellite so that you knew um, pretty, pretty quickly afterwards that you had worked us and who the operator was. Sideband camp, uh, that's Gene and Arnie, and that's Walt. Uh, Walt is who uh, Gene was talking about with the sharks before. Then it was time to leave. What happened was we actually got there one day earlier than we thought because the winds were very, very favorable for us. Uh, which was, was good. We got an extra day's worth of work done in the beginning. Uh, what happened, though, was that a weather front came through when we were ready to leave, or before we were ready to leave, and the captain said, uh, it's the surface getting really, really rough. And uh, the wind was blowing onto the shore. Um, on the left over there, you see those, those, what looks like rocks. That's the coral in front of the island, and that's the coral where we had to get the, the uh, dinghy up to the shore. It became really, really difficult to do. 
So uh, we, we packed everything up. We left a day early. And this will give you a little idea of what that was. The wind is blowing into the shore. There's about 100 or 125 feet of coral, which is very shallow, very, very rough, um, and very, very holy. There's lots of holes. You step in the wrong place, you will go down into the, into the, the, uh, the opening. And you do not want to get scratched by the coral because you will get infected. So we really had to work hard on this. Um, the captain is piloting that boat. And you see that he's, he's really having difficulty getting the thing lined up so that the, the guys can actually jump on it. They only took two people at a time. They were, they were unwilling to have more bodies on that boat because of the depth. Uh, it was just too shallow. And here he makes the attempt. I think that that's Rob getting on the boat. Watch this. They get him on. And now Matt has to take the dinghy away and get himself repositioned to do this over again. He could not keep that thing in one, in one spot because it was banging against the coral. This was not fun. That's how we got the equipment in and out also. What we did when we left was we actually left our personal gear on the shore, uh, all packaged up. And um, a, a, a team, we put the youngest guys, which didn't include me, uh, and they all went back the next morning and they did another run, uh, actually several runs, and got all of the equipment uh, back onto the boat. Um, our objective when we, when we started this thing was to do 80,000 kisos. And we wound up with 126, uh, sorry, uh, 112, wishful thinking, 112,000. We also expected to have 18 or 20 unique uh, calls. We actually wound up with just under 25,000. Um, and that to me is just, was fantastic. That's 25,000 different people worked us. That's a little humor. Uh, we want to thank our corporate sponsors. Um, Ellacraft was fantastic. DX Engineering, of course, was fantastic. Um, Steph IR, an expert. Uh, Spider Beam, great job. Northern California DX Foundation was first and foremost, as almost always, uh, in uh, supporting us. Uh, German DX Foundation and a whole bunch of clubs really helped us. Uh, Tim M0 URX is our QSL manager. Everything is, uh, goes through him. He's got the logs. Anybody had an issue, he's the guy that you have to talk to. Uh, a thank you to our pilot team, uh, Glenn, who is the chief pilot sitting in the back there. And uh, we had pilots uh, all over the place, including uh, in, uh, in uh, BK. Luke, an uh, old friend of ours. These are the four major groups that supported us. Northern California, German DX Foundation, uh, the uh, CDXC, the UK, and the Swiss DX Foundation. Next expedition we're doing is South Orkney, 2020. That'll be in February and the beginning of March of next year. And uh, look for us. Um, we don't have a call sign at this point, but we should be uh, fixed with that next week, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Les. Now, he said they left the island earlier. Everybody that's been on the expedition, how many of you haven't had to leave the island early? Really? We've had to leave the island early every stinking time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, tickets on sale? Yeah, I was going to do the commercial, yeah. Okay, well, you want to do the commercial? Real quickly. Okay. Uh, while we're changing over, if you want to see Pat, or uh, Rob, Rob over here on the, other, on the other side doing the raffle. At the conclusion of the forums, we're going to draw and give that all mode uh, Yezu 991 to the person who has the, the ticket. So if you haven't gotten yours, please do or get some more of them. And uh, Jay, back to you, sir. All the proceeds, all of them, go to fund the D expeditions like the ones you're, you're, you're getting presentations on today.
as we get ready for the next presentation. Uh, we've, I'm thir certainly enjoyed the two that we've had so far, but this next, next one has a special honor. They were last night awarded the D-Expedition of the Year, and uh, you know, it's tough to pick that every year. We always have a difficulty, but uh, the, uh, the uh, KH-1 stroke KH-7 Zulu uh, actually got the award for this year, and Zorro made a special award afterwards uh, for it as well. So the name of this one, since they named it as well, is uh, KH-1 stroke KH-7 Zulu, the rest of the story, getting there. So we're going to hear from Don and from Kevin. Uh, I don't think I need to make any other in introduction. Who's going to go first? Kevin, OK. It's nice to look out there and see some folks that I know. <laughs> OK, yeah, keep talking. What am I going to talk about? Uh, anybody have anything you want to say? <laughs> Or actually, hey, while we're waiting, any questions for the Ducey Island group? Any questions? They're sitting right here. We can have them answer for you. No? Okay. Nothing there. Yeah, we'll do another commercial. And at first, I'll do a joke. I'm not a comedian, but okay, what's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a unicycle versus a well-dressed man on a bicycle. Anybody got it? A tire. Who said that? Very good. Ha ha. Uh, this is a shameless uh, advertisement for our Southwest Ohio DX Association DX Dinner. It's held at the uh, Marriott UD downtown on Friday nights of Hamvention weekend. I want to encourage you to go to our website, get your tickets now. It always sells out. But we have, uh, as part of your, your ticket purchase, um, like 15 different prize packages. And typically, we have two high-end HF radios that, if you think about it, your odds are 350 to 1 of your ticket being pulled. And we made some people very, very, very happy last night. And you could have been one of those. Uh, 350 to 2, that's right, Jay. So I want to ask you guys to consider that and join us at the dinner. It's a great time. We have a lot of good fellowship. And after the dinner, we have a, a trade win sort of a, a reception area after the banquet. And we just uh, kind of shoot the breeze and, and have a great time. So thank you, Jay. Yep. Pat's in the back. You know, we only have one more presentation after this one, and then we have the drawing. So get your, uh, get your money out. Get that billfold out. And some of you think you've already bought the winning ticket, but you know, you double your chances if you buy uh, another set of tickets. I think we're almost ready. I hope so. Uh, anybody have any questions for us or any feedback at this point? Hey. No? All right. Well, um, again, on behalf of the Southwest Ohio DX Association and uh, Yesu, since they give us the radio to give away here, uh, we want to thank you for attending and uh, hope you'll, you've enjoyed it. We're ready for feedback when, uh, when it's over with. They've got the form, and you can also uh, see me and Kevin. Okay, hey, I don't know if you all realize this, but the guy that was up here beside me just a little while ago, Kevin, he won last year the grand prize at the dinner and turned right around and won the grand prize here. So he wants you to know he didn't buy a ticket for here this time and it's not because he don't want to support us, but it's because he didn't want you to think that we have it rigged. <laughs> and he did win a prize last night even though it wasn't a major prize. That's the luckiest family I know. Kevin, you ready to go? Yes, sir. All right, turn it over to Kevin. We're gonna hear all about uh, this great expedition that got to the Expedition of the, award, uh, of the Year Award. Jay, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, Jay, thanks. We'll keep the mic here if you don't mind. <laughs> um, uh, Don and I would like to tell you about uh, getting to Baker Island. I think most of you have seen the videos and the stats and, and heard about presentations from Island. So we want to tell you a little bit about what it took to get there. So we're going to start out with a, uh, a video. Is the video going to play? No video today. 
Uh, come on, video, play for us. There we go. Play, play. Nope, not going to play the video. Uh, not our day today. All right, no video today. Sorry. <laughs> we thought it would play. Um, okay, Don, you're up. Yep. So why did we go to Baker Island? Uh, it's a top ten, uh, depending on when you look at uh, club log. It was five, it was six. Um, by the time we got there, Kosovo had been on the air, so we were up to five. We knew it would be popular. Um, it's rare for a reason. The reason is it's hard to get licensed and permitted, um, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So it's on the equator. It's a long distance from the population zones. A little bit of history. That part of the world uh, was frequented by whalers. They had fished out the Atlantic. So the Nantucket whalers had to go around South America. And then as they went into the Pacific, they found uh, these uncharted waters and islands. Um, the captain from Nantucket was named Michael Baker. He first found Howland, and he named it Howland, and then he found Baker, and he named it after himself. It's good to be a captain. Um, the American government took over under the Guano Act when we acquired a lot of uh, islands. Uh, it was further occupied during World War II by the military, and you'll see from some of the pictures they built a coral landing strip. Uh, as I said, it's just north of the equator, treeless. Um, there is nothing there. They told us it's arid, you won't get rain. Well, we found that differently. It's a bird sanctuary. When the military was there because of the plains, they pretty much cleared it of most wildlife. By the time we got there, there were seven to 10 million birds. They told us to keep away from the wildlife. Good luck. Um, became a, ref a refuge in uh, 74 and then uh, uh, it became part of a larger monument a few years ago. After we were, uh, the Dateline DX Association went to Mozambique, we did as Gene did, we sat around, what's rare, where can we go next, and we wanted to go back to the Pacific. How do you get a permit? In March of 2015, I got in touch with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife people, we told them we'd like to go to Howland Island. Uh, they said put in a formal application, which we did, and then we didn't hear anything for about a year. Uh, we kept inquiring. We were then told they're reorganizing. Uh, now we're in March of uh, 2016. Uh, in March of 2017, they finally did reorganize and appointed a new superintendent for that part of the Pacific. And they, found, they determined that there was no compatibility determination, which is a document that needs to be written by the Department of Interior that says ham radio is compatible with going to Baker or Howland. We were then told we couldn't go to Howland because um, some people had gone there illegally and had left their mark and they had ruled it was not until they got there and cleaned up, they weren't going to let anybody go. So we were invited to resubmit our application for Baker. Uh, we helped rewrite the compatibility determination. That was then published in a federal register. And three years after we started this process, we got an email that said the Dateline DX Association was chosen to pursue the finalization of a landing permit two or three months after that we did. I think you're up, right? Yeah. So um, you can see the team of operators we finally ended up with. Um, uh, the one person that's not here that actually didn't make the island with, but, but started with this was, was uh, Tom Harrell, N4XP. Um, he unfortunately had a lot of uh, medical problems that prevented him from coming. Uh, but he uh, sort of jinxed the team list because it was about a month before we were scheduled to depart, and he said this is the first expedition he's been involved with where um, team members were not coming and going all the time. 
And a week later, of course, we lost one team member. Then another week later, we lost another team member. So anyway, um, but we had a great core team. Um, for me, it was an interesting uh, path to the leadership is in that uh, Tom was still pretty sick when, when, when we finally got the call that we could go, and he called me and asked me to take over as leadership for it. So that was an interesting path. Um, the other things we, we ran into was, was the permit from Fish and Wildlife would only let us go uh, certain times. And they wanted to send a resource manager along with us, uh, which uh, we had to work around that person's schedule, and they didn't yet know who it was going to be. Uh, one of the rules is we had to be out of there by September 2018. Uh, and we'd gotten the permit in um, uh, September, in, in, in June of 2017. So we originally were thinking going in September, October, November time frame. What we found out is that um, that's hurricane season, and no boat captain would sail into that area before May 1st, and they wanted to be out there by the end of September. So that basically put us into, the, into June in terms of the boats that we could find to actually get there. So the boat we ended up picking was the Naya. Um, one of the conditions of the permit was that the boat had to be approved by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, um, some people I know about the Machaya out of Hawaii, uh, we had listed that on our potential list of boats that we wanted to use, and we got an immediate phone call from the head of Fish and Wildlife in Hawaii who said, the Machaya is not allowed to go on this trip. Uh, enough said, we didn't ask any more questions. Uh, I don't think any of us were opposed to that, but, uh, and Hawaii's a long ways away, as you'll see very shortly. Um, so uh, the, the choice of the Naya was it was a new boat for us, but it uh, turns out to be a great boat for this. It worked out very well, uh, but uh, this also drove the budget as to what we would do. Um, so uh, we did actually go see, you can see the, um, it, that it's, so, so the dimensions of the boat, it's, a, it's a basically a dive boat, a steel dive boat, live aboard, 120 foot by 30 foot, do nine knots. It'll sleep 18 plus a crew. Uh, so myself, my wife, and 9 Victor 1 Yankee Charlie James Brooks went in, um, in February to visit uh, the boat, check it out, talk with the crew, um, and make sure the boat was actually adequate since this boat had never been on a cruise this long, this far away from home. Uh, they're typically a seven-day dive boat, um, and it's brand new to the de-expedition world. And the week before we got there is when the three Yankee Zero Zulu uh, crew had failed with their boat, so we had a lot of trepidation. Uh, so you can see the distance from, from Hawaii, it's almost 1,900 miles. Um, American Samoa, which is where we actually had to sail from, yet another requirement for the Fish and Wildlife Permit is we had to leave from an American port. Um, and, and so we basically picked American Samoa. Um, Hawaii was not a good choice in distance. Um, so some of the success factors associated with it was, was, was you could read up there. Um, we, you know, you know the, f the first question is, could the boat hold uh, crew and food for a month. Um, and after working with them when we met in February, it definitely um, was, was very practical to do that. So we were very convinced we had a good boat. And as it turns out, um, our resident uh, uh, boatman, uh, George AA7, George Victor, who also owns a very large boat, as you know from the Desheo uh, tri yeah, trip, uh, was very pleased with the boat as well. So, so it turned out to be a good one for us. Um, we also found that, as you know, I noted here, that uh, uh, it turned out to be a personal fit for all the KH-1 operations. Um, so on to getting equipment tested and assembled. Uh, we basically ended up shipping 3,000 pounds of equipment to the island. Uh, as you can see, we packed it out, uh, the tents, the, but the, um, the radio equipment, um, and everything was assembled. So here it is getting ready to go. We did a try run at, at my house in California. Uh, Ross packed for us, uh, and then there you can see it went on to the freight. Um, shipping costs were an important part of this. Uh, no, Don, you're supposed to do this part, sorry. You're always stealing my lines. Um, shipping uh, 3,000 pounds uh, to uh, Fiji, uh, which is where the ship was headquartered, cost $20,000 on the outbound. Uh, import duties and uh, VAT came to about another $10,000. Um, we had freight in the US to uh, worry about. Um, but we got everything by June 14th loaded on the ship in Fiji. Some of the crew went ahead to meet there. The rest of the team met on the 19th of June in American Samoa. 
Um, we then sell the to Baker, this is the timeline that we expected. We actually got the Baker a day early. Um, here we are, uh, the 19th, we got together with the crew for the first time as a whole team, went over how we were gonna land, the positioning, uh, who would take over uh, when we got to the island. And here we are finally, uh, over three years from when we decided we'd try to go to Baker Howland on board Maya. Um, the SUP uh, said we had to keep away from wildlife, as uh, we reported. As we approached the island, you can see some of the seven million birds rising in the morning to uh, um, wish us hello. Yeah, I'm back. <clears throat> um, so obviously, beginning of the supply runs to get things onto the beach, so you can see. Um, interestingly enough, our captain, um, or our, the boat owner, Rob, the captain was actually a different fellow. Um, had contacted Noah, who sails to the island about it once every two years, and had actually been there slightly before we were there uh, to find out how best to uh, get on to the island. So they found a good place to do it. Um, so here you can see the inflatable pontoon boat. He actually went and bought this boat to, to actually uh, get us onto the island. Being a dive boat, they have, they have two good, very solid uh, metal skiffs that they use for transporting the divers. And hopefully this video will play. Yeah, here we go. Okay, no, no, no audio with this one. The audio is great on this one. So what you have to do, going over the reef, which you can see below the boat, um, we're waiting for a wave. And if you really look carefully, you'll see fish, skates swimming around our boat. There's one right there, two of them actually. So Rob is waiting again for the right wave. He's finally about to catch a wave and not run over a couple of skates. He guns it, he gets to the beach. They jump out and spin the boat before the next wave comes in and lets the water push it back up on the beach. And this was on a calm day. So that's how you get on Baker Island. One of the good things about the Naya was the Fijian crew. These guys could, and gals, could lift anything, and they really did, in 100 and plus degree weather on the beach, take a lot of the workload off the team. Here we are, bringing everything in. The supplies were coming in faster than we could deploy them. This is the site location. The access was from the west, so we put the stations on the west. In the middle is a day beacon. Um, it's on the map as a lighthouse, but there's no light, so it's a day beacon. We put the sideband and main operating tent on the middle of it. We then ran cable for south to digital. And we kept the CW operating tent all the way to the north. There's the lighthouse in the middle. You can see the south. Here's the CW site, we had three stations. The main headquarter tents. These tents, by the way, were with us on VP8ORK. We bought new covers for them, another $12,000. The tents are going back to VP8 with Gene. There's a sideband, and here's the digital tent with two stations for RIDI and FT8. Here's some of the antennas. Um, five antennas at the CW site. Um, what we call the AA7JV FAT160. It was designed by George. We also had VDAs. Here's the three at the sideband tent, and we had three more antennas at the digital tent. One quick thing, if you look at the beach, the permit said we had to be on the beach. We landed, it was uh, about seven in the morning, and it was already approaching 90, 100 degrees. The resource manager, Allie, who was with us, and was on that beach in that heat, and noticing that the ridge was blocking the wind, said, this isn't gonna work, go up on the hill. So when you work closely with fish and wildlife, you can have a permit that says anything, but they are realistic about what um, they really will allow you to do. Yeah, so you can basically see our tent set up here. 
Uh, and, as, and as Don said, these came from VPH ORK. Um, let's see, on to the next one. We're short and running a little slow there on time. Um, so um, sitting in the tent, Allie was our resource monitor, the person that worked with us pretty closely uh, and helped us a lot on the island. Um, so this is uh, us putting up the big IR antenna. Uh, many people have put these antennas up. Uh, most people don't find it too difficult. Uh, but the problem is when the sun came up, uh, you could only work on the beach for about 30 minutes. So we actually tried to do most of these by moonlight, and that was one of the things that tripped us up. Is the first night we were there, moonlight came out, it was very good, and we said, okay, the next day, we couldn't work during the day because it was too hot, so we said we'll work at night. So the sun went down around 5 o'clock, um, the moon didn't come out. <laughs> um, instead, uh, a two-inch rainstorm came in. So never rains on Baker. Um, so, but we did get the antennas up, as you can see. Uh, this is George and Mike and Tommy putting up the FAT160. Uh, and then we finally had the, the DHDL loops up as well. Uh, the two element wire beam, George uh, uh, pulled in this design from the three Baker seven guys, worked out very well for us. Um, and then uh, you can see basically this is the view from the beach. Um, this is, uh, Don, you want to jump back in? This is James Brooks' fav favorite shot, our sleeping quarters. We called it the Baker Island Hilton. Um, it was up on the ridge. It got wind from the land side. The problem with getting your wind from your land side is there's about 10 million residents there doing their thing. And the odor was something you won't forget. Here's Allie's executive suite. She had a fish and wildlife little pup tent. And the latrine, do you want to take this? Um, uh, when we got our permit, it said that uh, you must remove all human waste you know, um, you know, from, from, from your bodies as well as all the garbage you collect. You have to take it off the island. Can't leave it on the island. Uh, in, in January, I wrote a letter back to Fish and Wildlife, an email describing what we were going to do, some of the things we'd chosen, and, and said, and by the way, we plan on building a latrine there. Uh, I get an email back from Laura and Allie, our Fish and Wildlife says, the permit says you have to remove your human waste. And uh, we're all going, uh, okay, I can read the permit. I know what it says. But uh, we, so we just sat on this a week. A week later, I get an email from Ali describing a particular way of building a latrine that they were happy with and, and, a, and a comment saying if Don will call Laura as the, as the original permit holder and say, would you give us a variance, it might get granted. Yeah, sure enough. So we got to build a latrine. Um, uh, it was a little hard because the, cause the coral's down about two feet. Uh, but the Fijian crew jumped in and, and made this work. So uh, we did not have to haul the human waste off the island. And in fact, uh, George took charge of making sure that the latrine was burned to the ground before we left. Um, so just some pictures. Yeah, the, um, the, uh, the uh, tent made it a little hot in the, in, the, in the afternoon. If you went in there to take care of business during the afternoon, um, you probably lost two pounds just sweating it out. Um, so most people tried to hold till later in the day when the sun went down. Uh, we also had generators. Uh, in this one picture, there's, you can see there's a, there's a sort of a white bird sitting, standing on the sand. Um, he adopted that generator, and later on, he actually stood right next to it. Um, and we never could figure out why, and Allie basically said that this was probably, um, that he felt more secure there. But, you know, we fill up gas, we made sure we didn't spill gas on him, but he was not going to move. And when we finally turned the generator off and started hauling it away, he finally started leaving. But the rest of the time, he was there. Um, so <clears throat> um, here's an Elecraft station setup. So in the small world category, the answer is two people that you never expected to be connected and in a major way. The answer is the boat owner, Rob Barrel, and the owner of Elecraft, Eric Schwartz. Um, when I was at Elecraft arranging radios, Eric comes up to me and says, what boat are you taking? And I says, ah, you don't know it. It's the Naya. Um, and he said, no. I actually met my wife on the Naya. I've been on it several times. I know the boat owner, Rob. <laughs> and they hadn't connected with each other for a good 10 years or so. So I reconnected, and they had a nice reunion. So I thought that was kind of funny. Don? Here's the on-island uh, team leadership, myself and Kevin. As we said, N4XP uh, was the off-island uh, leader because he couldn't go. Here's some of the uh, operators, Bud, Arnie, Neil. Those three are not with us today. 
George, who is in the audience, James Brooks, who uh, did the video, which we'll show at the end, um, Tommy, Ken, uh, sitting here. When the band was open, as it was a lot to Japan, Ken would find an open station and work his friends. And in fact, Ken made more CUSOs um, than anybody else on the team because he had the biggest audience. Um, here's the Digi Palace. Um, we in anticipated that we would have one station on RIDI and one station on FT8 using the new FT8 Foxhound mode. Um, this is how we set it up originally. We found out that we could work two to three hundred an hour on FT8 Foxhound versus 80 to 90 on RIDI. It didn't take, and that required two operators. It didn't take long before we discovered that you could work one operator, both stations on Foxhound FT8, and make between three and 400 cues per hour. Whenever someone was off a shift, even if I didn't put them on the schedule for operating, we would find they would gravitate to the digital tent. You know, if you've been on expeditions, you have to pry people with a crowbar to get them into the RIDI operation desk. And after about an hour, they just go out and jump in the ocean. Sharks are no ocean. Uh, sharks are no sharks. What happened is it was fun. It was relaxation. You'd come off a four-hour shift of handling even the craziest Italian pileup, and you go in the digi tent, and this is what it looks like SO2R. You click to the left, you click to the right, you stand up, you sit down, and you log them. Um, so um, one of the interesting aspects is, uh, is how Fox, Fox Hound Mode came about. When we started the expedition, um, I wanted to make sure that we could run digital contacts. This is before FT8 was out. That we could run digital contacts, aka RIDI, at the same rate and volume that we did for CW. I'm um, not sure why I was after that, but that was something we did. And uh, Ned stepped up and said, you know, let's talk to Joe about getting FT8 in a mode that could work. And so Joe worked very closely with us uh, to get the Foxhound mode. And we went through several, several releases and testing sessions before we were actually ready to go with it. Uh, one of the issues with RIDI is it's very hard to work anybody uh, because everyone splits the tones on you, so you only can work at the very far edge of the band. So Joe came up with the Foxhound mode to get, uh, get that going. And probably the highlight for Dodd and I was, was last night. Joe came up and congratulated us uh, for the expedition and thanked us very much for actually proving that FT8 was very useful on a de-expedition. Don? Yeah, Don's got a good one here, though. This is a good one. So while we were on Fiji after we returned, we started getting a lot of emails that people weren't in the log on FT8. And at first, we thought there was a problem. So I started researching some of these emails on not in the log, and we have the all file from the FT8 software, and they're just not there. And OE7MPI sends me a screenshot saying, you guys really screwed up. You're doing something wrong with your logging. And he sends it. And I'm looking at this, and I'm going, well, it looks like we worked them. Until in the upper right, you see KH7 CQing from Grid Square K077, which is in downtown Moscow. So lots of Europeans had worked a pirate who was too stupid to take his Grid Square out of the uh, software. Here's that resource monitor. She learned how to operate FT8 and even had fun doing that. Never rains on Baker, huh? Well, there are some of the never rain clouds that would come through. Um, here's the before and after pictures of the uh, crew of the Naya fixing the Baker Island sign. Each morning, we'd have team meetings about areas that the pilots were reporting. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some shots of the island. There's a Loran navigation station. Some of the settlement remains when they tried to uh, um, inhabit this crazy place before World War II. Uh, Guano settlement, that's an anchor from the 1800s. 
an old crane from the military days, an old bulldozer. Military pulled out and just left, left everything to nature. Um, tropical birds, frigate birds, sunsets. If you've ever been in the Pacific, you know what a Pacific sunset is like. You'll remember them the rest of their lives. Uh, last time at the beach as we were leaving, like uh, the last expedition up, a weather front was coming in. Uh, we saw it on the maps and we said, let's get out of here. Um, we cleaned the, f again, we did some, uh, the Naya cleaned up the beaches. Fish and Wildlife was very happy. Here's some uh, blue-nosed dolphins uh, leading us as we leave the preserve. There's a very large pod of bottlenosed dolphins. Um, not sure you can see them jumping out of the water. They're not, there they go. We caught barracuda on the way back, finally got to the port. Um, where did the money come from? As you can see, North America, 77%, Europe 13 and Asia 9. Uh, this excludes the team members. Team members put up half the money, um, as you can see there. Individuals, 27%, 90% of that money came in after we were operational. We still try to get out the word that we have to buy the boat uh, charter before we go. Um, clubs and foundations, 24%. Um, unique call signs, we actually had more unique call signs with Europe than we did with Japan, and a lot of that, again, was FT8. Keep going. 17% uh, of uh, the queues were from Europe. 42% um, from Asia, we have to do a better job raising money in Asia. Here's the queues by mode, even though we did a lot of FT8. Um, you can see CW was still over half our queues. Uh, the, the map showing how hard it is to work Europe over the North Pole. Um, so that's largely what we wanted to tell you about Baker. Um, but I think that one of the notes is, is, is we consider it a success for, for three reasons. Um, one is, is we broke even financially. Uh, the second is, is that um, everyone came back, no injuries and no deaths. So we felt very good about that. Um, it, was, it was a very hot place. There was no, no chance anyone's going to get injured and die from it, but uh, heat exhaustion was a very possibility. Arnie was our doctor, and he regularly kept track of us, made sure we uh, were doing good. Although there was one point when we were packing up, I finally sent Arnie back to the boat because he was starting to be pretty bad. Uh, and the third thing, the most important thing, is we made QSOs with everybody that wanted them. Uh, at first, that... Um, we, um, people did not think that we should go in June, that we would not be able to make any contact with Europe, but we did very well for Europe. We covered Europe very well in terms of countries. Um, and at this point, uh, I'd like to take a minute and ask all the, uh, uh, the KH1 operators and, and staff to stand up and get known or seen. So please stand up, KH1 people. Just quickly do that. <laughs> Thank you to all of you. Uh, it, was a, it was a great staff, and we couldn't have done it without them and without your support. Do you want to try to get the video going? Yes, try to record that. That'd be okay. okay. Um, what, what the other takeaway was, we all came back friends. We knew each other before we went. Um, we worked well together as a team, and I think uh, we're already thinking of the next place in the Pacific we want to go and uh, most of us want to go back together. So uh, the pileups were good. Thank you guys. If we can queue up one video, um, it was done by James Brooks. It's short, but it says uh, it all about uh, Baker Island from a viewpoint of a drone. And I think here it is. Uh, no audio. Well, you'll have to just visualize the music.
There's nothing like a James Brooks video. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm surprised you didn't mention anything about so some of the history of the island there, guys, like Amelia and uh, the population. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the settlement. If you haven't read about that settlement they tried to have there before World War II, it's very, very interesting. Uh, would, I would encourage you to look that up and do some studying on that. Anybody here from the operation that was in that area that thought they got stuck on the island for the, what was it, an extra week? Nobody here from that one? Okay. Again, this is an interesting place and quite a challenge. Um, as you come up, Glenn, it's going to take us a little bit to get settled here. And I tell you what we're going to do is while we have the opportunity, uh, we've had three presentations so far. And I'm running just a little bit ahead of schedule. So if you've got questions of any of those that you haven't had your uh, uh, and questions answered yet, we'll pose those questions right now. Any, anybody have questions for any of the three presentations? No? You guys aren't, oh, here we go. Baker, okay. What's the question? The question was how big's Baker? It's about a, a little over a square mile. Uh, about three quarters of a mile wide or long and then a uh, half a mile wide. Any other questions? You know, I noticed both of the last two have talked about having the SV, uh, SVDAs, and I remember, uh, where'd Ann go? When we were on Clipperton, one of the complaints we got was somebody said that, you know, those guys aren't, aren't very strong at all. What are they using, verticals? Yes, we were, SVDAs. <laughs> So, those are beams, folks. Okay, Glenn, you we about ready to go? I'll introduce it. Uh, you know, this last year, last night we had a, a silent moment for folks we've lost in the past year, DXers, et cetera. And uh, one of the folks, we don't normally do this, but one of the folks, and I'm hoping some of the contesters made it here, I made this the last presentation for our, our session so that some of the contesters could be here and hear it as well. But uh, Paul W0AIH uh, unfortunately fell off his tower this last year, and I was looking for somebody who could uh, do a little tribute for uh, what Paul has done, et cetera, in the DX and the uh, contesting arena. So I finally got Glenn to agree. I had, I, you know, I had to dig deep to have somebody who was willing to talk. It's unusual. But uh, Glenn's agreed to do a, do a small tribute to us on uh, on uh, Paul, and he's titled his, I have to get these things out to remember them, uh, w, The Legacy of W0AIH, What Can We Carry Forward? Well, I think that's a good, uh, good way to look at it. Glenn, thank you very much. Any questions again before uh, we turn it over to Glenn? All right, here we go. Glenn, W0GJ. Thank you. How many have worked W0AIH? I mean, who hasn't worked W0AIH? How many have been to the farm? How many could keep up with Paul at the farm? No one. Well, Paul uh, was born on Christmas Day, 1933, and uh, died last fall in a tower accident. And we're going to talk about that dash in between those two dates. He was born Christmas Day in Nebraska. His father was a Lutheran pastor, and Paul was eventually too. He was licensed at the age of 15. That sounds familiar to a lot of us. Graduated from high school in 1952, and Dick Airhorn was one of his classmates. And he graduated from Concordia Seminary in 1958. And one time I was working with him and on the crane that said 1949. And he said, that's the year I was licensed. And I said, that's the year I was born. And he said, I've been a ham your whole life. You got to understand Paul, how he emphasizes things. Here's a picture of him when he was 15. Here's a picture of him in Concordia College. And he was able to get 
talked to the administration to put a beam on top of the administration building. He had a lot of degrees. He had a Bachelor of Divinity degree, but he also had a BS degree. He was the best scavenger. I don't think he spent a dime on a tower. Everything he put up that, for example, a lot of his towers came from his church. The church would bid, the church, Paul, would bid on tower demolition, and the church would get the money, and he would get the towers, a win-win situation. So he made a lot of things. He had a degree in EE. He was probably the most enthusiastic Elmer you can imagine. He also had an MS degree. He had many signs and license plates, a sense of humor. And he also had a PhD degree, the priorities that he defended, his faith, family, missions, and actually his radio hobby was at the bottom of the list, if you can believe it. Many years ago, um, he and Mary acquired this farm, about 130 acres from a, um, a parishioner that died. There was no electricity and no running water on this farm. And shortly after Paul and Mary got it, the first thing that went up was a 164 square and a tall tower, again, without electricity or running water. And antennas grew. It really was an antenna farm. It grew and grew more antennas. And from the top of this tower, you can even see the curvature of the earth. Well, maybe this was a drone or an airplane shot, but that's what it looks like. When you drive by on the interstate, this is what you see. And uh, you would always ask Paul how many towers he had. I don't know. I just want to put up six more this year. And, you know, one time I was there a few years ago, and I actually lost count somewhere around 70. And whenever he'd go someplace, he would climb your tower and take a picture. And he made the cover of CQ magazine once, twice. Nobody makes it more than twice on the cover of CQ magazine. There's the third time Paul made the cover of CQ magazine. This is building a tick, the world's largest tick ring from a silage unloader, and it eventually turned a 40-meter beam. And like I said, he made everything. He did a lot of welding. He made his own rings for his rotating towers. Uh, he made his own rotors, big heavy things. He was uh, really quite a mechanic. He had so many antennas, nobody made antenna switches, so he made his own out of coffee cans. So this is what his antenna switches looked like. And he had an unlimited supply of aluminum and tower and antennas, and in the shop he could make about anything. And there was no antenna project or tower project he didn't have hardware to help you with. He had quite an assortment. And every place he went, he took his AIH buckets and his big come-alongs. That's what I remember. And if you'd go to a tower project, he would bring everything with him, more than you could ever use. And his gin pole would give most hams tower envy. And of course, he wouldn't make things better. It always had to be bigger. This is Paul's idea of a gin pole. His favorite gin pole was a 40-foot section of Roan 25, and he could handle this himself. I helped him with it a few times, but he liked to ride the rope. Once he got it up there, he liked to ride the rope, and unfortunately, that's what was his demise. Instead of climbing and being connected to the tower, he was always riding the rope, and um, that fateful day, the, the, the rope that held the pulley at the top of the tower failed, and that's what, uh, what happened to Paul. And this is his truck, Big Gulp. He had a name for everything. And this is Mary, his wife. And uh, Mary always winched him up and winched him down, so they must have had a very good relationship. And he always lovingly referred to her as his winch winch. <laughs> this is uh, inside the contest station showing uh, for a multi-multi only five positions because the 20-meter shack was all by itself. And those are the control cables and coax cables for just 20 meters. Always big. Everything was big. This is Paul working the uh, Wisconsin QSO party last year, and he got first place. Can you imagine that? So he was really proud of that. This project, the 80-meter beam, three-element 80-meter beam, he worked on for several years, and the boom was 120 feet of pie rod. Pie rod now is solid steel. So that's, I don't know what the, boom, what the beam weighed, but that was the three-element beam. There it goes up by a big crane, 
And he designed it so you could go out and work on it. And you can see the little thing you could strap onto and go out. You, <clears throat> a Paul, maybe not me or you, but Paul would go out there and work and tune the, tune the elements as needed. And I can tell you this three element beam is probably going to be up longer than any three element 80 meter beam in history. But his favorite antennas were rhombics. He loved his rhombic antennas. And uh, several years ago, um, he put up a wind generator. He was very proud of this. He, he was very proud of the fact that he never paid an electric bill after this thing turned on. He said it powered, every, he said it powered everything in his station except his key. And I said, we'll see about that. So I made this for Paul. <laughs> and he loved it. I don't think he had DXCC license plates, but he had worked all continents many times over. You can see Zorro's license plate there at the bottom. There's Africa, South America. There's even Bhutan on there. So lots of license plates, lots of signs, There's even more license plates. And he loved Burma shave signs. How many remember Burma shave signs? Well, he had one going up his driveway once. Don't take a curve at 60 per. Would hate to lose a contester. Burma shave. He went to WRTC last year um, for WRTC and also to see his fifth daughter, Sandy, who's here today. Stand up, Sandy. And he really enjoyed WRTC. But, you know, he always would climb a tower and take a picture, but the security guards at each of the stations wouldn't let him climb a tower, so he had to climb something. So he climbed a stile and took a picture from the style. And, you know, Paul was a Lutheran minister, and five, over 500 years ago, Martin Luther uh, put his 95 theses on the wall of the Wittenberg Chapel, or cathedral, but Paul had one more. Everyone should honor the organist and all who play music in any church. Music is a great addition to church worship. So that was Paul's 96th thesis. He also uh, got to know Gennady, UN7QF, uh, over the radio. And uh, to make a long story short, Gennady came to the U.S., went to seminary, and started uh, many churches in uh, the former Soviet Union. And Paul would go over and he would operate from there. And he married many hams, and last year was his last wedding with Jerry and Val. And uh, he was quite a DXer. This is the DX forum. And, uh, he had, uh, according to ARL, 390 countries confirmed. Who has the most, does anybody know what the most countries that anybody has ever confirmed, whether they're alive or silent key? 393. Well, just before he died, Paul was working on another submission. There are 402 entities possible and he had 10 that he was working on to submit. He had, car he had found cards for five or six of these and uh, hadn't quite found the others yet, but you know, he might have a record. 10 years ago, he was inducted into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame and Paul and Mary were married 65 years. This is one of my favorite pictures of Paul. <clears throat> it was taken a couple of days before he died. And, you know, at age 86, you know, 180 feet, this has got to be priceless. He didn't mince words. No one could keep up with him. He retired as a pastor at the year in 2000, but worked as a renter of for another 17 years. And he knew his destiny, and he designed his own gravestone he wanted an obelisk that looked like a tower, and he had even prepared his own funeral service. There's his gravestone. There's an epitaph on it. About 12 years ago, Paul and I were traveling to Dayton, and we were laughing about funny epitaphs that were on tombstones. And uh, he said, I want to be buried with my Bible, my hymnal, and my original key. And he recited Isaiah 53 many times that, 
predicts the coming of the Messiah. And he sang, he was just saying long songs from memory. And after we got back from Dayton, I said, He called me and said, that's it. I'm putting that on my tombstone. That's my epitaph. I said, but Paul, it's too long. He said, that's what I'm going to put on my tombstone. And this is what he put on it. A Bible, a hymnal, and a key, a passion for these three. The key is now silent, but Paul King's with the Savior of Isaiah 53. Twenty eighteen, sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Anyway, that dash is our life. That's what everybody's going to remember. And time can be our enemy and it can be our friend. What will you leave behind? What's you know, it's not too late to change course. You can use your resourcefulness, your enthusiasm, your humor and priorities. And what priorities will you defend? Paul really liked the ARRL, and he was a Maxim Society member. And when he got his Maxim cards, he sent this to me. You can donate to it with GoFundMe. The ARL Foundation, you can just Google the W0AIH Scholarship Fund and you'll humor, but most important, he defended and was not ashamed of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After the funeral, So if you want to look at more about Paul, you can uh, go to QTH.com or just Google W0AIH. And again, here's his uh, epitaph. Any questions about Paul that I might be able to answer? Yes. I think I'm, I'm done. Leave that up. Leave, no, put, put that back up. All enjoy that if you can enjoy something like that, but it's nice to know that some of us do have something around our dash, if you will. At least somebody will have the same kind of feelings about us. Okay, we have one more shot for you folks. Before we rotate them and put it on the bottom, but five tickets for 20 bucks of five bucks each. And I hope somebody. Okay, Pat's back here in the back, walking around selling tickets. If there's anybody else that. Rob's coming up with the, with the uh, barrel. We're going to have draw. Who doesn't have anything in? Sandy, you have anything in?
Okay, if you don't recognize her, this is Terry from DX Engineering. Every stub in? Please get them up here. And uh, while we're waiting, folks, to come up, uh, you know, you've, you've heard a, a lot of the different organizations that have donated. program at the DX dinner last night. Please support those folks who support us. And uh, there have been a lot. From Ohio. <laughs> Even when it's the wrong end of Ohio. <laughs> So, all the tickets in? Okay, I've known the winner personally the last two years, so maybe this year I won't know the person personally. He does All right, I hear you, Mindy. Pat's got some more. We're unabashedly looking. And again, the money that we get from this, Yesu donated the radio, but everything that, uh, that we get. Association. And if you don't know a whole lot about us, we were formed uh, 30 some. to sponsor the DX Forum. So um, I know a little bit about it, but not as much as uh, most of you guys out there. To have some fellowship with those folks that we work. And I, like I say, I look out there and there's a whole bunch of you that I've uh, worked from the other side. Of Oh, they're Sandys? Okay, we blame her. <laughs> We're still ho within our time. And those of you that live in W8 land, uh, in I think <laughs> Owensville, but we're going to inaugurate a W. This year, we're trying to. To more or less Elmer, following in the uh, the theme for Hamvention. Speaker is going to be Tim Duffy, and he's going to come down here and and uh, and. and now. Fire when ready, grid. Uh, fire with ready, Gridley. Yeah. Okay, Terry. Let's. Terry, announce it. Okay, I have 
K7HI. Kilo 7, Hotel India Lima. Okay, I guess we'll be mailing it to them. Thank you very much.